We are on camera. Today's November 8th, 2018. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer at the History Center. And with me today is Carrie King, who is also a volunteer, and Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy. We're honored to have with us today Mr. George Enlow. Mr. Enlow is a veteran of the United States Navy and has agreed to come in and talk to us in connection with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Uh, Mr. Enlow, we really appreciate you coming in. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing your experiences in the Navy and your experiences in life. And we want to thank you for your service and thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, would you give us your full name and what town you live in now? All right. George Emmett Enlow, Jr. Uh, I live in Avondale Estates, Georgia. Okay. Where and when were you born? I was born on the Presidio in San Francisco when it was still an active Army base. Mm -hmm. uh, my birth date is November the 8th. Happy birthday. Uh, 1947. Wow. Talk a little bit about your upbringing. Well, I was born into a military family. My father was um, in the Army. He was probably a first lieutenant or captain at that point in my time. I think he was a first lieutenant at the time. And um, we were in on the Presidio transiting to Japan. He had just been assigned to the 11th Airborne Division in Japan, which was uh, still considered occupation forces on the island of Honshu. And uh, I was, my mother was too far along with me to travel, accompanying him directly to Japan. So. They waited until I was born, and then my mother carried me across the United States to New York Army, uh, to New York Harbor. Mm -hmm. You know, the Army, in its infinite wisdom, provided transport originating in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> so she carries me on a train across the country, boards a ship goes down the East Coast through the Panama Canal, across the Pacific, over oh. to Japan. Good gosh. And the earliest pictures I have of myself at home is a photo with me as an infant and both my parents in front of a Christmas tree. So I had to have been very young, and I have absolutely no memory of any of that, yeah. nothing of Japan. Oh. Uh, to put it, in a nutshell, by the time I was 13 years old, I had lived in three foreign countries, six states, crossed the Pacific four times, crossed the Atlantic twice, transited the Panama Canal. Um, and I was an army brat. I went wherever my father went. And we moved every two or three years. And usually it was 6,000 miles or plus or minus. So you saw more of the world before you were 15 than most people do in their lifetime? Uh, probably, yes. You went to obviously a lot of different schools. But, but yeah, my early school experience is the earliest one I remember was a French kindergarten. <laughs> My father had been posted in France uh, to an abandoned, uh, well, not abandoned, but uh, a former Luftwaffe base near the city of Bordeaux in southern mm -hmm. France. And he was assigned there as the base construction officer. And oh. It was the U.S. Air Force, but, you know, the Army Air Corps split off from the Army and became its own separate branch of the service back yeah. in whenever that happened in the late 40s. And they didn't have a fully developed engineer corps in those early days, so they borrowed a lot of people from the Army, okay. I guess. And my father was one of those people. So my, those are my 
They're not quite my earliest memories, but that was my first school experience. I went to a French kindergarten, and then a first and second grade was a DOD school on base near Bordeaux. And third and fourth grade was Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Dad mm -hmm. was in the 82nd Airborne mm -hmm. at okay. the time. Then we went over to Taiwan, and I went through fifth and sixth grade there, and started seventh grade. I uh, went through seventh grade in uh, a civilian school. That was my first experience with a civilian school in Hinesville, Georgia, which is Fort Stewart. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dad retired, and we moved to Jacksonville uh, when I was about halfway through the eighth grade. Uh, and that was in November of 60 when Dad retired from the Army. And so I finished up eighth grade in Jacksonville, and then Dad moved the family to Albany, Georgia, and I went uh, through high school in Albany. When you were in France, uh, you were fairly young, but do you have any memories of seeing the damage from the war yes. in France? Yes, very vivid. Talk about that a little bit. Um, I would say, and this is what I've gathered from reading, um, probably up to 90% of the highway and railroad bridges in France have been bombed out during the war, either by us or by the Germans. And the French were very busy rebuilding their entire infrastructure system, all their bridges, their roadways. So I remember seeing that. I remember seeing the destruction in some of the small villages when we went on driving trips. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess most of the evidence of that is gone today. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, in uh, 1951 and two and three, which is when we were there during, yeah. the, during the Korean War, um, the evidence of the war damage was everywhere, oh. but they were well along the way. Okay. You know, and some cities were Bordeaux, for example, was untouched. Oh, it never got bombed, so the old city was there. And of course, Paris never got. Did you have any opportunity to deal with the French people? Much oh with? yes. Um, there was no base housing force in Bordeaux. So we lived on the economy, and we had rented a uh, what had been a, a French farmhouse, and we were living in that, and the landlord, I guess, rented the fields out because the farmer next door took care of them. But uh, he had a, a boy about my age. His name was uh, Dunyan. Dad said I called him Onion. <laughs> uh, he didn't speak English, I didn't speak French, but we got along famously. Yeah. So he was my primary playmate. So, yeah. And we had a French housekeeper who came in a couple of days a week. I called her Madame Fannin. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember her, she, used, she had one of those gas-powered bikes. Uh -huh. and. That's how she got herself around, putt-putted, and she lived on a nearby farm with her family. Jeez. And occasionally when mom and dad went on overnight trips, they didn't want to drag the kid along. Yeah. I got farmed out to Madame Fannin. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, <laughs> states that would spend the night with her and her Gosh. family on their farm. And there are a lot of some interesting stories from that time period, but yeah, I do have I have memories of Europe in general. We went on a lot of driving trips. I remember being taken to the German Alps, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember seeing a bullfight in Madrid hmm. yeah. as a five or six year old at the yeah. time. I thought it was a pretty brutal <laughs> yeah. thing to watch. Uh, I'm not a fan of bullfighting. I don't think yeah. it's a fair fight for the bull. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I, I just. I think it's overhyped. <laughs> you were pulling for the bull, huh? I was pulling. By the end of the fight, I was pulling for the bull, <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, the bull never had a chance. No. Um, Once you got out of high, excuse me, go ahead. Well, uh, 
I remember a trip to Italy. I remember okay. riding a gondola. Oh, okay. In Venice. In Venice, yeah. Yeah, and they're just little snippets. I remember going to the French beaches. Those were interesting. Yes, I'm a sure. A lot of the stories you hear about French women are true. <laughs> and um, their ability to change clothes on a public beach without exposing a thing is remarkable. <laughs> That's a real skill, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, so, yeah, I have a lot of memories of Europe. Those are some of my earliest memories, yeah. although my earliest memories are Fort Campbell. Okay. Uh, the 11th Airborne was uh, demobilized from Japan in 48-49 time frame, and Dad was reassigned to the 101, which was based in Campbell at the time. Okay. And uh, I still remember snippets of uh, living in the base housing at Campbell. I also remember uh, my mother taking me out to the practice drop zones and, you know, watching the paratroopers huh. jump out of the planes and hmm. mother pointing out, there's your dad's up there somewhere. Uh, did you ever want to do that? No, I had no <laughs> desire to jump out of airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> when you went into the military, were you drafted or did you voluntarily join? And, wh and when was that? What were the circumstances under you, uh, which you went in the military? I enlisted technically voluntarily in the Navy, but I was within weeks or even days of being drafted okay. when it happened. Uh, when I enlisted. Um, this was 1967. It okay. was pre-lottery. Okay. You know what that means. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the lottery, I think, didn't start until 68. I believe that's when like they started time. using the yeah. lottery to draft people to Vietnam. Yeah. Um, so I enlisted in the Navy. I decided to pick my poison. The trade-off was four-year hitch versus the two years yeah. that people were getting drafted for in those days. And um, I uh, was sent to uh, uh, RTC, that's Recruit Training Center, that's what that means, uh, in San Diego, which is, if you know where Camp Pendleton is, yeah. and you know, the base is divided in half, one half's the Navy, the other half's the Marines. And um, um, that's where I went through basic training. Let me back up a second. Um, I know you know what the lottery is and I do, but people that are watching this may not. Just briefly describe what the lottery was and how it worked. Well, not having personally been subjected to it, I'm going from memory here, but lottery numbers starting in 1968 were assigned to all draft eligible men based on their birthday that was literally drawn out of a bowl mm -hmm. somewhere I guess in Washington and you know all right number one anybody born on May the 8th you yeah. know yeah. you're number one yeah. and they were going in strict drawing order huh. as to how many you know they had an allotment every year we're gonna we need to draft 150,000 or 200,000 people this year and uh, everybody who's drawn a number from one to I think it went up to over 200 for a couple of years anyway I don't know yeah. I was on I was on active service at the time yeah. so I wasn't yeah. paying that much yeah. attention to it uh, I did have some male cousins who were behind me in age who got high enough numbers that they didn't get drafted okay so of my immediate peer group, you know, my male cousins, uh, I was, as far as I know, one of the few that actually went on active service. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I thought that would be interesting to somebody well, watching this yeah. that's never heard of the lottery. But, uh, I mean, that's how they did it in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, and I don't know if that system's still in place. I know the draft is. I know there's still a legal requirement for yeah. people to register for right. the draft when they, what is it, 18 or 19? Yeah. One or the other. Yeah. You know, when you turn 18 or 19, yeah. even yeah. today, yeah. you're required to register. But right. as far as I know, the military hadn't drafted in decades. Yeah. Okay, well, go ahead and continue with your 
you so know, you know career. RTC San Diego uh, one of your questions was you know interesting experiences about your training a couple of things uh, one I was nominated by my uh, drill instructor as the outstanding recruit in my training battalion. Uh, wasn't selected, it was down to me and one other guy and the officer who interviewed us both picked the other guy. Um, but one outcome of that was the Navy offered me just about every kind of advanced training they had. You want to go to sub-school, we'll send you to sub-school. You want to go to sonar school, radar school, fire control, whatever it was, um, they offered it to me. There was one hitch though. S extend your enlistment for two more years because we're going to send you to school for two years and we mm. still want four years out of you. Okay. And I said, nah, I'm not going to do that. So they sent me to the fleet. The other interesting thing, and I guess because of the publicity they get nowadays, uh, there is a long waiting line to volunteer for SEAL training. I mean, it takes months. And I don't think they take anybody who isn't at least 21 anymore. Yeah. Um, but during Vietnam, they were recruiting, and they were actively recruiting. And towards the last couple of weeks of our training cycle, a couple of SEALs came through our battalion looking for volunteers. Uh. And there was about a half a dozen of us that said, oh yeah, we'll go take your physical. And, you know, and I took the physical and passed it. And, uh, but then they showed us some film the training <laughs> and combat footage, and I decided mama didn't raise no fool. <laughs> and that was it. I said, thank you, but I'll decline. And, you know, there wasn't any rah-rah trying to, you know, say this isn't for everybody. Yeah. you got to want this. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, I don't really want it. Yeah, so. Um, so that was that. So I got sent straight to the fleet and to the Kearsarge. And I reported aboard Kearsarge in August of 67. Um, as soon as I reported aboard, um, I did some first thing they did, and they, I guess they do this with all boots in the fleet, or in those days they did. They sent me down to mess duty for six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and then once that was over, you know, the Navy has a policy. They make a notation in your personal record. Okay, he's done the mess duty. He doesn't ever have to do it again. <laughs> it's like KP in the yeah. Army, I yeah. guess. Um, um, and then they put me in the radar gang. And uh, that's uh, where I did my entire first deployment was in the radar gang. And we left Long Beach in uh, Long Beach, California. That's where we were home ported. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kearsarge, uh, by the way, that's hole number uh, 33. Do you have a picture of that? Yes, that's, I this do. This might be a good time to. Yeah. This sure. is a photo of the ship. And it's, uh, well, it's well documented on the internet. I mean, you, Wikipedia articles on it, mm -hmm. you know, there's sites dedicated to the Navy that give unit histories of just about every major warship okay. the Navy had. This photo I, looks like it was taken during one of our deployments. You, I don't know if it was the first one or the second one, probably the second one. Yeah. And the inscriptions that are on there, the writing, that's uh, an inscription from the commanding officer, uh, Matt, Captain Nearman, the man made, L.L. Nearman, and it reads, to each of the Wildcat team, that was our tactical call sign when we were in the Gulf, it was uh -huh. Wildcat. Um, 
Fair winds and following seas, L.L. L. Nearman, Captain, U.S. in command. Wow. He was our, uh, he was the CO, and I was part of the, part of the last group of about a hundred crew okay. that marched off the ship at the decommissioning ceremony, which was held in Long Beach. We were decommissioned in, I'm going to say, December of 69. Okay. Thereabouts. Uh, I may be incorrect on that. I'm right. going from memory, but yeah. that's when it was. So, hmm. anyway, that's her. The aircraft that are on the deck are S2 squadrons, a Hilo squadron, a BAW squadron, which is the AWACS type aircraft. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if any of our A force we had, at least on the first deployment, we had a. Uh, not a full squadron, but we had four A-4 aircraft that we used for our combat air patrol. Okay. And you mentioned AWACS. People watching this may not it's know what a, that is. It's an aircraft uh, early warning system. It's an aircraft that the airframe's been modified to carry a heavy radar dome. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is uh, how the Navy, one of the defense, it's primarily a defensive plane. They're, okay. they're looking for okay. both surface traffic and uh, enemy aircraft, okay. which we saw plenty of both while yeah. we were in the Gulf. Okay. Uh, well, just looking at your bio, you had a lot of experiences on various ships and going different places. Why don't you just carry us through your, your time and where you went and what experiences you want to talk about. Okay. Uh, I'll start with the first deployment. <clears throat> That's when I was in the radar game. Uh, one of the, I remember my first deployment in our, or the first time I was in the Gulf after I had been assigned to the radar game, I was being trained on the surface radar repeaters. That's what we called them, were repeaters. And uh, they were transmitting the signals directly, either from our own radar arrays that were what you see mounted on the mast of any naval warship. Uh, in this instance, uh, we were getting a signal from one of our AWACS aircraft that was in orbit over the Gulf near Haiphong Harbor. And while I was being trained, I was assigned to a training petty officer, PO. Um, and he was telling me how the controls worked and you know how I was supposed to communicate what I was seeing to the people on the plot board and uh, to, the, uh, to the officers on watch that were also in CIC with us. Um, and he started pointing out shipping traffic in Haiphong Harbor. Almost every single ship that what I was seeing on that repeater was either Russian or Chinese. Oh. And we couldn't touch them. We could not touch them. That had to be frustrating. It was. Uh, none of us understood that at all. Didn't make sense to me then, still doesn't now. I mean, my view, whatever else you can say about the Vietnam War, if you're going to fight a war, damn it, fight a war. Yeah. Yep. No holds barred. Yeah. Nothing's off limits. And because you're afraid of starting, you know, otherwise, why were we there? Yeah if we were going to do it with one hand type behind mm -hmm. that. That was yeah. my attitude then. A lot of people will argue with me on that point. You know, should, you know, that would have started World War III. Well, maybe they're right. That begs the question. Why were we there in the first place? Yeah. If you're not going to fight it, why even be there? Yeah. So anyway, uh, but Typical rotation in the Gulf would be about a month out there, and we'd go to a place like Subic Bay or Manila, and that was mostly uh, refit, 
or resupply and a little bit of R&R. &R. Subic wasn't great liberty, neither was Manila, but uh, you know, you could leave the ship and go ashore and do things that sailors do when they're ashore. Yeah. Um, when uh, about three or four months into the deployment, we uh, got an R&R &R trip up to Hong Kong. So we go up to Hong Kong. It's only about two days steaming from the Gulf, from the Tonkin Gulf to get up to Hong Kong. When you look on a map, they're not that far apart. Yeah. And um, we anchored in Hong Kong Harbor, and I happened to be in the Liberty, got drew Liberty for the first section that was yeah. allowed to go ashore day one. So they put us in the Liberty boat, take us in, and we get off in the Wan Chai district. If you've ever been to Hong Kong, yeah. you know yeah. what I'm talking yes, about. Yes, I do. <laughs> That's kind of the red light district yes. of uh, Hong Kong. And uh, like most sailors, headed for the nearest bar. Yeah. And I swear I hadn't been in there five minutes, and here comes the shore patrol. <laughs> and um, I had a Kearsarge tab on my uniform sleeve. You know, every in the Navy, everybody wears the name of their ship on their uniform, whatever ship you're assigned to or whatever unit it is. Anybody who's got a Kearsarge tab, back to the ship, emergency recall. Uh. And so they herded us all out. And then, of course, it crew of our escorts as well. You know, we had a half a dozen destroyers with us, and uh, we bu and up to anchor a couple hours later and bugged out, and we were hitting flying speed by the time we got to the harbor mouth. When I say bug out, we were bugging out, and um, nobody knew what was happening at first. We weren't told why we were being recalled, and we get on the about cleared the harbor mouth and the captain comes on the 1MC. The 1MC is a shipwide PA system. It's, that's what the Navy calls it. And the first words out of this house, men, we're going to war. Hmm. Wow. And, you know, you know, the little pucker factor kind of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that sets in about then what's going on. And this turns out was the Pueblo incident. Okay. Uh, I won't... Uh, recount the details of that, it's well documented, but uh, the USS Pueblo, which was an electronic surveillance ship operating off the coast of North Korea in the Sea of Japan, had been captured by the North Koreans. And um, an American sailor had been killed and the rest had been taken prisoner by the uh, North Koreans. So off we go at flank speed the whole way into the northern sea of Japan in February of 68. Spent the whole month of February. We were conducting air ops up there and that's the coldest I've ever been in my life. Average daily ambient air temperature was probably between minus 20 and minus 30. When we would turn into the wind to conduct air operations, the wind chill could bring it on the flight deck down to about negative 100. Negative what? 100. Good grief. <laughs> it was so cold that the ship's medical officer decreed that nobody was allowed to spend more than 30 minutes on a weather deck, flight deck. And I was standing, I happened to be in the lookout rotation at the time. <laughs> so for a whole month, I don't think I slept in my rack the entire month. You know, you'd, You'd spend, because the regular watch rotation, which was normally four hours, they're not going to leave you out there for four hours. Yeah. So, because you'd freeze to death, literally. Yeah. The temperature is that cold. And um, so they put us in a watch rotation that would allow everybody to stay out every, for 30 minutes, and that was it. And then you'd get an hour. And you could use that hour to sleep. Try and get some chow, 
uh, learn to like C rations, and K <laughs> rations, and um, well, I won't say like them. Learn, I got used to them. Tolerate them. <laughs> Tolerate them. Yeah, and uh, <coughs> you learn to sleep anywhere. I mean, I learned. To, I didn't think it was possible to sleep on a steel deck, but I learned. How. <laughs> And uh, we did that for about a month, and then Ranger came up with her battle group, USS Ranger, another aircraft carrier uh, that was used during the Vietnam War and relieved us. And then we got sent back to Long Beach. Uh, instead of sending us back to the Gulf, they cut our deployment short about a month and said, uh, go back to Long Beach for a refit. And they pulled us in the dry dock in Long Beach, and we were there a total of about five months, I think. A couple of first couple of months in dry dock, getting our bottom cleaned, and yard birds all over the ship, doing the refit. Yard birds is the Navy term for shipyard workers. Um, so we did that. Then uh, we had a couple of months of sea trials uh, off the California coast, uh, mostly anti-submarine work. That was the primary mission of the Kearsarge. We were designated as an anti-submarine warfare ship, ASW is the acronym for that. Um, and we were wargaming with our own fast attack boats, which in those days were the Sturgeon class of fast attack boats, the immediate pre predecessors to the current Los Angeles class that are in the fleet today. Um, <coughs> to put it bluntly, our subs ran circles around us. We got sunk so many times. Huh. <laughs> in theory, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. One of the most vivid memories I have from that period doing our ORES off the California coast, um, a Sturgeon class boat surfaced in our wake about 500 yards behind us. Did not we did not know he was there. I was on the bridge at the time, uh, but back up a second. I had transferred from radar to navigation. So I was up on, I stood my watches up on the bridge and in the pilot house. So I was in tune with everything that was happening yeah. tactically aboard, you know, ship. And um, um, that Sturgeon class boat surfaced in our wake, pulls out goes behind us, gets back in front of us, just like passing a, two cars passing on a freeway, and goes back down. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, we're all just looking at one another. You know, he got us. We're dead. <laughs> you know? And uh, I knew instinctively then that the Kearsarge was technically obsolete. Yeah. As were all the Essex class carriers. You know, Kearsarge was an Essex class. But long story short, we uh, we got orders to go back over for our second deployment. And when we were o over, being off the coast of Vietnam. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so on the transit over, uh, things got interesting again. We were conducting OR, an ORE exercise jointly with Enterprise. And what's ORE? Operational readiness exercise. Okay. It's what any naval warship goes through prior to combat deployments. Okay. So we're on an ORE with the Enterprise, uh, CVM-65. At the time, one of the newest and most modern aircraft carriers in the fleet. And they were loaded for bear. They had um, uh, most of their attack squadrons uh, deployed on the aircraft conducting their exercise. And there was fire and explosion aboard that was utterly disastrous. Uh, I don't know how much this made the news in the States, but something like 100 airmen and sailors were killed in under a minute. 
aboard the Enterprise. Hmm. Uh, Enterprise pilots were literally ejecting out of their planes off the flight deck. And oh. um, a lot of their flight deck crew were, if they weren't killed outright in the explosions, were blown overboard or jumped overboard to get away from the fire and the explosions. And of course, we were near the scene, so we were dispatched, our entire Hilo group was sent over to start picking people out of the water. And our escorts were sent over to us, go alongside Enterprise and help with the firefighting. Uh, they, she probably had a half a dozen ships around her just throwing water on her hangar deck and flight deck. And it took them hours to put the fires out. Mm. Um, and they were supposed to, you know, we were supposed to go over to Vietnam together. Of course, that delayed them. They had to yeah. go back to the <coughs> shipyards in Hawaii for repairs. Uh, that's a separate story. But co coincidentally, or at the same time, one of our S-2 patrol aircraft picks up the signature of a Russian S Echo class attack boat. They're hunting around us. They're sniffing. So we got sent off on a high-speed chase, which was about 33 knots for us. For several days, we chased them all the way to the Marianas Islands. Hmm. And that sub literally outran us underwater. It got out of the range of our patrol aircraft. So that's over 200 miles. Hmm. Um, and we lost him. And so here we are in the Marianas. We outran our own escorts. That's how fast we were going. And um, the Navy said, well, not going to make you backtrack, so just go on over, do your first deployment. That was the longest continuous sea period. That was a 57-day sea period that I underwent. And uh, being in navigation, of course, I was taught navigation by a very, very talented uh, senior chief quartermaster. So he taught me how to operate sextants and, you know, how to do that. So I, at one time, was a celestial navigator. Could do it the old yeah. school way. I'm not sure I remember how anymore. Yeah. And then it became a grueling routine at that point. And I used the word grueling deliberately. We were in a three-hour watch rotation, 24-7 when we were in the Gulf. And you were either on watch, trying to get some sleep or some chow. And I probably only averaged during that whole deployment three or four hours a day. So I was pretty wiped out yeah. after each sea period, mm -hmm. and in between we'd go into Subic, or uh, sometimes, uh, a couple of times, we got up to Sasebo or Yakuska. Liberty in Japan was nice. Sasebo's a nice town. Um, I had a chance to go to Nagasaki on a chaplain's tour from uh, Sasebo, because it's in the Nagasaki prefecture. and. I talk about this in a memoir I wrote for my family. <coughs> Excuse me, I need to drink sure. a little water here. My first view of Ground Zero in Nagasaki, the bomb crater. It is my desire my sincere wish that any American who thinks that a nuclear war is a solution to our political disputes with any country go to either Nagasaki or Hiroshima. <coughs> the level of destruction there was phenomenal. The Japanese have converted Ground Zero and probably a quarter mile radius around it to a peace park. But the crater there's a very shallow crater because this was an air burst. Yeah. And I was, uh, is there. It's quite clear what it, what, what it is. And uh, 
the Japanese say that <coughs> there was a hill there about 30 meters high that was just totally vaporized in the blast. That's a separate story. Well, that had to be an emotional experience for it you. Was. It was. It affected me greatly. The other part, during the course, and this happened in June of 69, June the 3rd, to be specific, we were on a joint CETO exercise with CETO, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. We were steaming in conjunction with units of the Australian, New Zealand, British, Philippine, Taiwan, and Japanese navies. And it was a war game exercise, you know, if the balloon went up, you know, and we were suddenly found ourselves in a shooting war with allied navies, you know, we train together to get used to working with one another. <clears throat> and I think we had some British and Australians steaming with us. And one of our escorts, the USS Frank E. Evans, the DD-754, was steaming in conjunction with the Australian aircraft carrier Melbourne, HMAS Melbourne. Um, there was a collision at sea. Evans was struck amidships on the e uh, or in the early morning hours of June the third, and the bow half of that ship sank in under a minute, and 74 of her crew went down with her. Uh, all 74 of those names are on the Vietnam Wall today, uh. along with a number of mostly air crew from Kearsarge and other ships working in the Gulf that were killed in active combat air operations uh. during the Vietnam War. Um, one of the questions you asked, you know, what two experience or what experiences stand out the most? Well, there are two for me. One is the Pueblo incident, just because of the sheer misery of dealing with that cold weather. Yeah. <clears throat> and the other was the Evans sinking. The, we, of course, were fairly close to the scene. And we went over, we immediately went over to assist with whatever we could and rescue. And at daybreak the next morning, it's in the Philippine Sea. It was very calm sea and the sight of a half a destroyer sitting dead in the water. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I'll never forget that, ever. Um, mm. you know, there are a lot of other things that happened over the course of two deployments, but those are the two that... Yeah. Uh, stay you know, with you. That stay with me the most, you know, especially the Evans sinking because yeah. the sheer loss, well, that and you know, a lot of people want to think that the Navy guys had it easy. <clears throat> when shit happens, it happens in a hurry. <clears throat> yeah. And there's not a whole lot of, uh, there's almost a feeling of helplessness. You, you, you've seen this happen and you know, there but for the grace of God. Yeah. You know? yeah. <clears throat> so, there you go. Mm. That's about all I have to say about that part of it. Um, in the fall of 69, sorry, I touched the wire. <laughs> um, we got orders to return to the States for decommissioning. And in late 69, the uh, Navy was ramping down. I guess in the Army you called that riffing. Yeah. Reduction in force. Reduction in force. And the <laughs> Navy was doing the same thing. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I guess that started in 69 for the Army too. I don't know. You tell me. You were there. But it was uh, 69 or 70. Yeah. That period. 
So anyway, the fall of 69, we get back to Long Beach and we go through the whole decommissioning process, um, preparing the Kearsarge to go into the mothball feet, fleet and uh, they towed her up to the shipyard in Bremerton when we were done. We finished in December of 69. It's Bremerton, Washington. Just for the record, there's a okay. huge naval facility there and shipyards and dry docks that are that can accommodate ships the size of an aircraft carrier. Yeah. And uh, the um, not much to say about that, just a lot of grunt work for yeah. several months mm -hmm. and crew being transferred off the ship and constantly during the whole period. Um, <clears throat> when we first arrived in Long Beach, uh, the Bureau of Naval Personnel, uh, the West Coast, Bupers West, came aboard and set up in the hangar deck in one of the hangar bays and uh, interviewed all of us. And I remember um, going when my turn came, you know, and the personnel clerk looks at me and says, all right, <clears throat> what do you want, the Ranger or the Ariskany? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, you know, I've been two and a half years deployed now and should be eligible for shore duty by now. And he says, yeah, you are, but you don't have enough time left on your, on your enlistment. I only had about nine months to go in yeah. the Navy. And I'm thinking, they're going to fly me out <laughs> and put me on a CVA, an active aircraft carrier, one of them which was already operating in the Gulf and one which was on its way over. And then halfway through that deployment, they're going to fly me back home. And I says, there's no way I can get a shore assignment. I've only got less than a year to go. He says, yeah, but, you know, you got to spend a full year. So, you know, if you sign an extension of your enlistment for three months, we'll give you shore duty. I said, where do I sign? <laughs> 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 you know, and... Uh, so that's what happened. So that's how I ended up staying to the bitter end of okay. the Kearsarge, part okay. of the decommissioning crew. And they still didn't have a shore assignment for me when I left Kearsarge. And Hornet was in Long Beach, had just been come in. And they pulled me. Uh, so I walked down the pier off the Kearsarge, got on the Hornet. And two days later, we took off up to Bremerton and went through the whole they started the decommissioning process up there. And I was only aboard Hornet for two months, and then my orders came, and I got assigned to the CB base in Gulfport, Mississippi, of all places. I didn't even know there was such an animal at the time. I never heard of it. And that's where I spent my last year in the Navy. Okay. Um, that's when I more or less started getting my head in, in mindset to get back into civilian life and um, just down the road about 20 miles from Gulf, Gulfport is uh, in Biloxi is an Air Force Base, Keesler Air Force Base and they had a night extension campus of uh, University of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg which is about not that far away from Keesler. And the Navy had something they called a bootstrap program, where they'd pick up cost of, or most of the cost of uh, college credits, courses and stuff. So I said, well, you know, maybe I'll pay for it. Started taking night classes at University of Southern Mississippi uh, Extension Campus on Keesler huh. Air Force Base and picked up about a year's worth of college credits that way. Just basic stuff, you know, freshman and sophomore level classes that pretty much have to have for any degree program. And um, applied to the University of Georgia. Um, I, before the Navy, I had gone to Tech for a while. 
Um, that's a whole different story. But uh, when I got my release from active duty in July of 71, uh, let me back up a minute. My whole time in the Navy, I was totally clueless and unaware of the level of uh, what was going on in this country and the protests over oh. the Vietnam yeah. War. And I guess the summer of 68 and 69, I was in the Gulf most of that time, yeah. or somewhere out in the Pacific. Never heard any of this stuff. And certainly didn't give any of uh, anything like that to us on Armed Forces Radio or, you yeah. know, whatever yeah. little bit of news we got when we were at sea. Yeah. You heard what your command, your senior officers right. wanted you to hear, and that was it. Yeah. And um, so I find myself on the University of Georgia campus in September of 71 as a returning vet. <clears throat> and I very quickly learned just to quit telling people I had ever been to Vietnam. Because this was the time, <clears throat> this was after John Kerry had made his Winter Soldier speech, mm -hmm. uh, which I had pretty hard feelings about for a long time. Yeah. I've since gone back and listened to what he was actually saying. And I understand it a little better now, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but all that nonsense, all that mess around Milai and Cali and yeah. Medina, yeah. all that was in the news daily. And I'm afraid that during that time period, all Vietnam vets were tarred with the same brush. Yeah. As far as the average uh, college kid was concerned, we were all William Cali or Ernest Medina. Yeah. And so I just quit telling people I had even been there. And, you know, went through, I uh, got an undergraduate in psychology thinking at the time, you know, that would be good prep for law school or med school or something like that. Probably could have done either. I had certainly had the intellectual capacity to succeed in law school or med school, but realized fairly early on that wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. And I had met and married my wife at the time, uh, one of the best things that uh -huh. ever happened to me. Um, and uh, we moved to Maine, stayed up there for five years. Huh. Um, that was a healing time for me. There were other vets, you know, that I could talk to. And we, you know, we shared stories among ourselves, but uh, didn't really discuss it with other people. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, gradually started reconnecting with my desire to become an engineer. So I reapplied to Georgia Tech from uh, Maine, was accepted, went back and finished up took me three years to get an undergraduate degree. They made me start over again with the whole calculus series. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I got through this time around <laughs> a little bit more. It, it's amazing what, you know, being married and having a kid yeah. will, will yeah. do towards your attitude towards uh, yeah. uh, a difficult course of study like I did at Tech. And graduated from Tech in um, 81 and had a pretty decent career uh, in engineering and construction. Okay. Worked a lot on, uh, in the early days, uh, MARTA at the project engineer level, wow. uh, and transportation, GDOT. I was uh, a project manager on the downtown connector in its current configuration for the contractor. Wow. And then I went to work for an environmental engineering firm when I finished up with the connector, spent about eight and a half years doing that. Then I went back to work in the transportation and water sectors again with a company called Parsons Brinkerhoff, or PB. 
um, and did uh, water, uh, eventually devolved into geotechnical work and became a kind of a tunnel guru in the country, and in the company. Um, the last 10 years of my career was all on tunnels, mostly in the water sector, but also in transportation a little bit. Oh. By uh, tunneling for water is conveyance. You're either driving a tunnel for wastewater conveyance or potable water con oh, conveyance. Um, and I did that until I retired about three years ago. Well, that must be satisfying because you drive around Atlanta, you you oh, see yeah. Marta, you see the downtown connector. And if you, were, you go to the airport, and I don't care how you go, if you drive, you take Marta, mm -hmm. you're driving over, under, or through my work. Wow. There's no way to get there without coming through something I had a hand in. I'll think about you every time I go to the airport now. Um, uh, that was certainly a more edifying part of my life. I, I very much enjoyed my work. Yeah. Maybe I'm one of those rare individuals that is fortunate enough to have gotten into a line of work that they get a great deal of satisfaction out of doing. Yeah. I did. So, um, I think I'm done for that. You want to mention anything about your family? I mean, obviously, obviously got a good wife. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I've got a great wife, uh, one daughter who's married and has uh, a grandson that we're very much enjoying, um, Malcolm. If Malcolm's watching this somewhere in the future, hi Malcolm, that's <laughs> your grandpa. Uh, uh, yeah, um, we're having fun in retirement, both of us doing things we want to do. Okay. Uh, other parts of my family, I think at the beginning of the interview, I mentioned my background from a military family. Uh, my father was one of six brothers, four of them um, were in active service during World War II. All four of them saw combat, two in the Navy, one in the Army Air Corps, who I mentioned to you before the interview started, my uncle Edsel Pug as he's known in the family, was a waste gunner on a B-17. Uh, got shot, his plane was shot down, he was captured by the Germans and spent the last 14 months of the war as a prisoner of war. Yeah. Huh. Uh, the other two uncles were in the Pacific in the Navy and both involved in the Battle of Okinawa, aboard ships, one aboard the Iowa, and I forget the name of the ship Bernie was on, but he was on Des Moines after the war. And my father went through World War II in the 13th Airborne in France and Germany towards the end of the war and was <clears throat> on his way over to uh, Japan when the war ended over uh, there. Uh. He always, uh, he was in the 13th Airborne and they were slated to drop in the initial invasion of Japan which had been scheduled for November of 45. Oh. Of course, the atomic bombs put an end to that yeah. in August. So that was that was that story. And then I already talked about it. And, you know, Dad went on to a career in the Army. Bernie and Pug both stayed in the Air Force. Yeah. Leroy got out of the Navy. He went to work for the railroad. So that's the brief family history. Did your father and your uncles talk about their experience as much? You know, I, <clears throat> not a lot, not to me, and I was too young to mm -hmm. know enough to ask him at the time. Um, after my father died, when it, I was the executor of his estate, and I was uh, going through his papers, and I found his jump log. He had kept that. Gosh. And if I'd have thought about it, I would have brought it in and let you uh, make a copy of it. It's two sheets of, well, it's basically a manila file folder, but it chronicles every jump he made in the Army. 
Oh. And he was, he had his master parachute wings. He made 101 jumps. Wow. Including one combat jump in France during Thanks. World War yeah. II. So uh, I come from a family that has a rich military history. You know, there, there are a lot of us that, just in my own immediate family, that served. Um, well, I know you're proud of them. Yeah, I wish I had, and this is the same regret I think a lot of us have, yeah. you know, when you're a teenager and in your 20s, you don't think about asking yeah. questions like that of yeah. your parents. And I don't guess they want to burden you with it. Yeah. yeah so. Well, that's what's good about this experience you're having of coming in here. Yeah. They're going to all have your story forever. You know, that's just the military history. I mean, I could talk about a 36 year in construction and engineering, but you know, that's, that might get tedious. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, if, if there is anything you want to say or get on the record, uh, feel well, free to I do it. I very much enjoyed my work. It was very edifying. I worked uh, up and down the East Coast and in South America and Canada, mostly in transportation and water. And stuff I worked on will be used for centuries. Wow. Wow. Maybe the archaeologists a thou couple of thousand years down wow. the road will be digging up some of the stuff I worked on. I don't know. Not many people can say that. I mean, that's got to make you feel like you've made a real contribution to... Well, I feel like I have. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> one of the things I want to say, and, you know, I don't at all want to glorify war. It's a horrible thing. And it took me, I think, decades to come to that understanding emotionally and truly, you know. When I first came back, I just wanted to forget about the whole thing. And I just pushed it out of my mind for a while. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it never leaves you. You know that. Yeah. It never leaves you. Um, you always think about it. You always think about the guys that didn't come back with you. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, uh, <clears throat> I wish our politicians understood that yeah. a little bit better. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you brought some material with you, and I want to be sure if there's any thing you want to put well, up in front of the I, camera, I just, we get it on there. And maybe just for the record, just so future ancestors, this is a copy of my cruise book from my first deployment. It's got my name on it mm -hmm. there, oh. USS Kearsarge. That is a representation of the Vietnam Service Medal, which yes. I'm sure you recognize. <laughs> and I actually have three stars on mine oh, now yeah. uh, because I had two deployments. This yeah. is from the first deployment. <clears throat> that's why it's only one star. <clears throat> and this, <clears throat> somebody down the line, I found, this is something else I found in my father's papers when I was going through his estate. It's a division history of the 13th Airborne Division in France and Germany in World War II. Wow. And my father was, I forget the number of his PIR, his Parachute Infantry Regiment, but he was a company commander with H Company, I think, yeah. at whichever regiment. It's in, his photo is in here, which will probably take me a few minutes to find it, so I won't attempt to do that online, but it's, it's in, It's in my stuff if yeah. you're looking for stuff to look at, yeah. whoever's watching this years from now, yeah. um, it's there. Well, you're fortunate to have that. I am. I am. I, I feel very fortunate to have that. And uh, I can't think of anything else to tell you right now. I want to give Carrie and, and uh, Sue a chance to ask any questions they may have. Go ahead. Sue. 
I, just one. Obviously, your experience in Nagasaki was very meaningful and emotional for you. Very. How your dad was essentially, I guess we could say, saved from invading Japan by the dropping of that. It's such a dichotomy. How, how have you thought about those two things together, and how do you make sense Constantly. of that? Constantly. Yeah. Um, Dad once said to me, you know, I was probably a teenager, <clears throat> he said, told me that I probably owed my existence to the atomic bomb. Uh. And of course I didn't know what to make of that back then. Uh, I was probably 21 or 22 when I went to Nagasaki. Six, nine, uh, I, was, I was still 21 at the time. Uh, <clears throat> it's a very peaceful place if you go there today. And of course the Japanese will never forget it. That or Hiroshima. I've never been to Hiroshima. It's on my list of places to visit one day. Uh, I'm not sure what I thought. I was expecting to see when I went there, and there were only about a group of about 20 or 25 of us. It was a chaplain's tour that he had organized, and I figured that was a better use of my time that day because it was uh, only a couple of hours drive from Sasebo to Nagasaki City because Sasebo is part of Nagasaki Prefecture. <coughs> and. Uh, we get there and they, Japanese, left remnants of the original buildings that were partially survived the blast. And you see these obviously heavily reinforced concrete buildings that were just all but vaporized. There's just very little left, a little bit of the foundations and maybe short stubs of walls. That's how powerful that blast was. And that bomb was a baby compared to what we have today. Uh, I've heard similar stories about Hiroshima. I've never been there myself. One day I'll probably go, but I haven't been. Um, another question that was in your list there was, have I ever been back to Vietnam? The answer is no, but I am considering doing it. And I'm considering uh, maybe not next year, but the following year, going on a tour, a guided tour that I'd like to see everything from Hanoi down to Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City now, I guess, and uh, maybe go up into the northern hills, you know, where the northern tribes that when we were fighting up along Laos. They were our allies, mm -hmm. nominally. Yeah. Yeah. I have some close friends that were on the ground up in that part of the highlands during the war who yeah. told me stories. So. Thank you. Carrie, you have any questions? Is there any? Yeah, I have two if I can keep Sure. Them. First of all, during your either your first or your second deployment, um, did you lose any aircraft that were uh, flying um, strikes over North Vietnam? Uh, our aircraft were mostly patrol aircraft. Uh, we did lose some helos because their mission, their primary mission was, uh, or one of their missions was search and rescue. Uh, there was The details are hazy, but it, I, I'm thinking on the first deployment, two or three of our helos got shot down, uh, mostly trying to pick up down pilots, either in Haiphong Harbor. I mean, these guys had balls. I mean, they just, they went right over the harbor with the NVA just, and, you know, we were doing everything I'm sure we could to suppress anti-aircraft fire, but, the, you know, if there was a pilot in the water, we moved heaven and earth to get him out. 
the other question I wanted to ask you is just a very brief question. Throughout your interview, you, you mentioned the Gulf. We were in the Gulf. We were in the Gulf. You're referring to the Gulf of Tonkin? Correct. Okay. Just want to clarify. Yeah. That. If uh, Yankee Station, for anybody who's not aware of what that was, if you look on a map and you draw a straight line from Hanoi, Haiphong Harbor, through, say, roughly the center of Hinian Island, Pick a point in the water about halfway. That's Yankee Station. And we kept three aircraft carrier battle groups orbiting around that point out in the Gulf, uh, Tonkin Gulf, almost the entire duration of the war. All those news photos you've seen of uh, the fall of Saigon in 75 and helicopters being pushed over the side of aircraft carriers flight decks pushed off because um, they didn't have any place to put them and they were on skids, not wheels. You can't tow them around the flight deck. So they just, every aircraft carrier cares, carries on the flight deck many bulldozers that are there to clear wrecked aircraft debris in a hurry off the flight deck and they just literally push them over to the side. That those carriers would have been on Yankee Station, hmm. all of them. Well, before we close, is there anything else you want to say, any message or just anything you would like to say? I wish our politicians would learn. Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say. That's to that. probably the best thing that anybody could say. You know. Yeah, I, I, I'm just so dismayed to listen to all these guys want to talk tough and they don't know what they're asking yeah, us to do. That's right. They do not know. Well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming in here and telling your story. I mean, you nobody ever thinks they're a hero, but um, you were involved in some pretty hairy activities. And I think one thing that's great about what you did is that there are people, I think, that say, well, if you're out on a ship, you're really in no danger. I, yeah. Anybody that says that, they need to listen to your story and some of the things that have happened. Well, you know, and it wasn't always combat operations. Um, uh, aboard an uh, aircraft carrier operating at sea, you got to think about what we have aboard. You know, all the fuel. Yeah. High, high test gas, aviation gas, jet fuel, black oil, all kinds of ordnance. And when they're arming planes, on, I mean, when these planes launch off, when we launch our aircraft, they're fully armed. So yeah. that stuff's all over the place. It's in yeah. the hangar decks. It's, yeah. you know, you, we're always moving it around. Something goes boom. Things go south in a hurry. Yeah. And during the Vietnam War, I mean, Kearsarge was fortunate, and you know, we never had anything that drastic happen to us, but the Enterprise blew up, Forrestal blew up once, uh, and uh, it was a bad incident on the flight deck of the Oriskany. I think it was the Oriskany. Mm -hmm. And every single time, the casualties were in the hundreds. And that really didn't get much publicity. It back didn't. Then. The Evans sinking. 74 guys dead in less than a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, fire was almost a daily occurrence somewhere on the ship. Mm -hmm. Somewhere. Mm -hmm. Half the time it was, or a lot of the time, it was jet exhaust or something being sucked into the ship's ventilation system. And, Somebody would see smoke coming out of a yeah. vent somewhere and yeah. call a fire alarm. We took uh, we didn't oh. take any chances. We took it yeah. seriously. Yeah. Well, you and your family have a proud military heritage, and I know you're proud of them, and they're proud of you. Yeah. And what you did after you got out of the military, I mean, you almost rebuilt Atlanta. So as you say, it, it, what you did is going to be around for a long time. And again, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming in and 
also what you did for our country. And we just want to thank you for your service. All right. Thank uh, you. I was pleased to do it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, your family will be glad.